Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this installment of our speaker series at the Center for Politics and Governance. I'm Ryan Streeter, the Executive Director of the Center, and I'm really glad that you're all here today. And I'm especially pleased that we're joined by Dr. Tevi Troy, who uh, is not only the CEO of the American Health Policy Institute and the former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and a senior White House aide, he's also an alum of UT. Um, did his PhD here in the American Welcome. Studies program. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to have you back uh, on campus here. Uh, Dr. Troy is a presidential historian on top of all of those uh, other achievements and has three books that I recommend to you, um, including the one that you see today here. Uh, we even have a couple copies here. Thank you for those of you who brought this. If you don't have a copy, go get one. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But his first book was on the, the influence of public intellectuals on the presidency, uh, intellectuals in the American presidency, which I understand you researched and wrote most of here uh, at UT at, in Austin. And his second book I recommend to you as well, if you haven't seen it, if you're into popular culture and its role in politics, uh, what Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted, 200 years of popular culture in the White House. It's definitely worth the read. And now third, we have Shall We Wake the President? Two Centuries of Disaster Management from the Oval Office, which is just fresh off the press. And you have before you a Wall Street Journal op-ed that Dr. Troy wrote in today's uh, issue of the journal, which I also recommend to you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tevi Troy to Austin. Thank you, Ryan, for that nice introduction. It is so great to be here back at UT. There are so many great memories, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I've got to give a special recognition to uh, Rabbi and Mrs. Levertov, who were uh, very helpful to me when I was here at UT. It was, my God, 20 years ago, but uh, thank you for all of your help. Um, and Ryan mentioned my Wall Street Journal piece, which is, is very kind. It's actually, that piece is from a few weeks ago. But I do have a piece in today's Wall Street Journal about how the presidential candidates might stack up in a disaster. So I urge you to uh, read it, and you, maybe you could send it around to the group. Maybe you could send it around to the group. Um, I really loved working with Ryan at the White House. Uh, we had a good crew there at the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, we had not only Ryan and, and myself, but also Yuval Levin. So we had three PhDs working on uh, presidential policy. It reminds me of uh, my first book about intellectuals and the American presidency, about all these PhDs who have worked for the White House in the past. And whenever I tell people about, I wrote a book about intellectuals and the presidency, they always say, hmm, short book, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, short book, but full of interesting substance. Uh, the other great thing about Ryan is he was very popular at the White House because everybody thought correctly that he looks like Vince from Entourage. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then related to my second book is uh, that President Obama was a huge fan of Entourage. I don't know if he's ever met Ryan, but uh, he was not only, he was such a fan of Entourage that he used to, they had a Sunday night meeting at the 2008 campaign, and he would try and end the meeting early so he could get to watch Entourage. I guess they hadn't invented HBO Go at that point. But, uh, so uh, the, the person trying to be uh, leader of the free world, and all he wanted to do was, well, was watch Vince and his buddies run around uh, LA. Uh, this third book is about presidents and disasters, and it grows out of my time working in the White House and at the Department of Health and Human Services. So while I was there, I had the opportunity, I wouldn't say the pleasure, but the opportunity to deal with a number of disasters. I was in government during 9-11. I was at the White House during Katrina, which was quite the experience, and Ryan was there with me. And then I also worked on the flu plan that the Bush administration developed in case of avian flu. Avian flu did not develop and avian flu did not end up being a problem, but we did have a swine flu outbreak in 2009. This swine flu outbreak took place before a single senior person at Health and Human Services had been confirmed in the new Obama administration. And they were trying to figure out what to do when, when flu breaks out. And what they did was they took out this Bush plan that, uh, that I had, uh, others had worked on and they used that. And it was actually a successful di disaster management because fewer people died that year, in the swine flu year, which is a particularly worrisome strain, fewer people died that year than in the average year from flu in general. So I learned that you can have disasters that are completely unexpected, like 9-11. You could have disasters that are not well handled, like um, the Katrina situation. Or you can have disasters where the government makes plans and it actually works out. And so what I try to do in the book is look at different examples, presidents throughout history, and try to figure out what strategies have worked, what strategies haven't worked, 
And also, what should we do from a public policy perspective going forward? Make recommendations about the different types of disasters I lay out. I lay out two big categories. I call them acts of God and acts of man. And I try and talk, about, uh, talk in the book about what we should do whether it, when each one happens or should each one happen. What I found in writing this book, and it was a little bit of a surprise to me, although maybe it shouldn't have been, is that the involvement of presidents in disasters has grown exponentially and in surprising ways. One of the first disasters I talk about in the book is a massive earthquake that took place in Missouri in 1811. At the time, James Madison was president, and he did not know that this earthquake took place for six weeks until after it happened. If you think about it, there was no modern communication. We didn't have texting. We didn't even have telegraph back then. We didn't have a railroad in, in the US at the time. And so there was no way to know in short order that something bad had happened in another part of the country. And so for the most part, the president was behind the times. There was no such a, an idea of immediate response to disaster because you didn't even have immediate knowledge of a disaster. I contrast this to what happened about four or five years ago. I live in Washington, DC, but I was visiting Washington State. 3,000 miles away from DC. And I happened to be on Twitter at the time, which probably I do too much, but in any event, I was on Twitter at the time. And I saw within 30 seconds that an earthquake had taken place in Washington, DC, in my home city. Just think about it. 30 seconds, I knew about an earthquake 3,000 miles away, and President Madison didn't even know about an earthquake in his day for six weeks. So there was a real shift in communications over time. Obviously, it's not immediate from having no modern communications to having Twitter and the constant immediacy that we have today, but it was an evolving process. And that evolving process had a great deal to do with the evolving and increasing role of presidents in dealing with disasters. But it was not the whole story, and I'll get to the other part of the story in a few minutes. But let me talk first about one of the first disasters I found where there was presidential involvement to a degree was in 1889, there's something called the Johnstown Flood. 2,000 Americans died. It was the biggest loss of life on American soil until 9-11. And it's this terrible flood that pretty much washed away a whole town in Pennsylvania. And the town elders of Johnstown, they go to this relatively new technology, a couple of decades old, of the telegraph, and they send a telegraph message to President Harrison, President Benjamin Harrison, who is the, uh, the president at the time, a Republican. And President Harrison hears their sad plea for help, and he responds by telling them that this is the governor's responsibility, and they should seek help from the governor, and should the governor task him, President Harrison, with doing anything, he will do his best to help, but this is really the government's role. Now think about this. Could you imagine if in Katrina, the people of New Orleans had sent a message to President Bush and he said, nah, that's the, the governor's role. Or any other president dealing with a modern disaster. It's just inconceivable today. There would have been protests and lawsuits and denunciations. But the town elders of Johnstown, they don't denounce him. They don't criticize him. They don't do, sue him. What they do is they send a message back to President Harrison saying, thank you. Thank you for your message. And the, I'm paraphrasing the exchange, but the exact quotes are in the book. And so you five lucky winners, you can check it out. The rest of you can buy the book and find the exact quotes. But in any event, the response I just found so shocking to our modern sensibilities. Now, I mentioned intentionally that President Harrison was a Republican. And some of you may think, well, of course, a Republican wouldn't give help, aid and succor to people who were in trouble. But at the time, it was a bipartisan consensus that it was not the presidential role to get involved in disasters. And in fact, I tell another story about President Grover Cleveland. President Grover Cleveland, interestingly, was Harrison's predecessor and his successor. The only time that ever happened in American history where you had somebody becomes president, loses, uh, somebody else takes over, and then that person, Grover Cleveland, wins again and becomes president for a second, a second but non-consecutive term. And at one point, President Cleveland was given a bill by Congress that was supposed to provide aid to people who were suffering from a drought here in Texas. It was, it was basically crop assistance for farmers who were in trouble in, in a drought. And President, Harris, uh, President Cleveland vetoes this bill. And in his veto message, he explains that it is not the constitutional responsibility of the President of the United States to provide aid in case of a disaster in local areas. So again, a very different sensibility. Now, I'm not arguing that this was always the wisest sensibility. In 1918, 
there was a terrible flu that took place in America. It was called the Great Influenza. Millions of people died worldwide. 675,000 Americans died. Just a staggering number. Can you imagine 675,000 Americans dying from an illness today? President Wilson is president at the time. He's very focused on World War I and on winning the war. But there's this terrible influenza raging. And he is told, he is briefed by his doctor, who was a Navy doctor, that the troop transports that are sending American boys, I'm not saying American boys and girls because then it was an all-male army, but they're sending American boys across the ocean to Europe to fight in the war, those troop transports are spreading the disease among American servicemen, and then they are not only getting sick, and 43,000 American servicemen died from the flu in that war, 116,000 total American servicemen died, but 43,000 of them from flu, but those servicemen, in addition to getting sick, are also spreading the disease on the continent of Europe. And Wilson is confronted with this and told about this problem. And it asked, please stop the troop transports. And he decides not to. And in fact, the person who was the equivalent of the Army Chief of Staff is on the other side of this debate and insists that Wilson not stop the troop transports and saying they are essential to the war effort. Interestingly, this conversation takes place one month before hostilities ended in Europe. So maybe they weren't so essential to the war effort. But in any event, the troop transports are not stopped. And Wilson does very little at all. He doesn't even mention the disease publicly. And I argue that this is a, a case of a real, really poor instance of presidential disaster management. Re Wilson really did nothing. And in fact, in the back of the book, I list the five best and five worst presidents at dealing with disaster. And Wilson, unfortunately, makes my top worst president list. But then some things start to change. And again, communication is part, but not all of the story. In 1927, there's a huge flood in Mississippi. This flood is an enormous flood. 250 people died, but it may have been as many as 1,000. We don't have as great records back then about births and deaths, that kind of thing. And at the time, President Coolidge is in charge. Now, President Coolidge, again, a Republican, but also had a reputation for having a limited view of constitutional responsibilities of the president and of the federal government. And he is not eager to get involved in this. But he has a cabinet secretary named Herbert Hoover. Hoover was named or nicknamed the Secretary of Commerce and the Undersecretary of Everything Else because he wanted to get in everybody's business all the time. And he had a much more activist role towards government. Now, Hoover is agitating to get involved in this disaster. And to be frank, Coolidge found him kind of annoying. In fact, at one point, Coolidge said, that man has given me nothing but unsolicited advice for six years, all of it bad. And there is pressure for the government to do something in this circumstance. And the pressure comes not only from within the government, from Hoover, but also from outside forces. Because now, you not only have some communications technologies like the telegraph and the telephone, although it's expensive to make calls. And you now have cars and you have trains. But you also have mass media. You have newspapers that are printed in a more immediate way. You even have the new technology, the nascent technology of radio. And one of the early comedians of American history is a guy named Will Rogers. And Will Rogers makes a joke at Hoover's expense. And the joke is that Hoover's slow response to the disaster, to the flood, is taking place in the hopes that everyone will have died in the meantime so he won't have to send any help. And it's the kind of joke that you can sort of imagine taking place on the late night shows in our day. In fact, I remember um, there was a, a joke by Jay Leno about George W. Bush when he was appeared to be slow in dealing with the Katrina situation. And, and Leno said something like, Bush was reluctant to send anybody until he heard that Louisiana had oil, and then he sent troops. So kind of make, making a dig at the Iraq war. But the, this whole sense of comedians, they play on a, a national consciousness or a conventional wisdom, this sense that multiple people have the same view of something uh, across the nation and that there's larger pressures at work. And so Coolidge does send Hoover there, and Hoover is very good at this kind of thing. In fact, he had a nickname as the Master of Emergencies. And he got that not only from his work with the Mississippi flood, but also in, during World War I, when he 
was in charge of trying to stave off starvation in Europe. There were all sorts of displaced populations, and he led food drives to help people in Europe. But he does his typical Hoover thing here in Mississippi in, in the 1927 situation, and he helps organize food and relief efforts, and he helps organize rescue efforts, and he really steps up and, and does a very good job and gets good credit for his work on that disaster situation. Now, ironically, Hoover is a national hero, and prop this propels him to the presidency, which he wins in 1928, but then the Great Depression happens, and Hoover then gets a reputation as being someone who's disastrous in times of disaster, meaning in terms of the Great Depression, and is seen as ineffectual, and not doing much of anything, and also a poor communicator. At one point in 1930, he says, the worst of the Depression is over, and there's a big headline in the New York Times, and the worst of the Depression was far from over. And so Hoover's reputation was made by disasters, but also destroyed by dealing poorly with an economic disaster. And then, here's the big shift that happens, President Roosevelt takes over. And Roosevelt is a master of these new technologies for communication, such as radio, he famously gives the fireside chats during the Depression that help soothe a nation that is wounded and suffering. But he also greatly expands the role of government in terms of the way he deals with the Great Depression or the new creation of the New Deal programs, but also with the expansion of government to deal with World War II. And Washington was kind of a sleepy town in the 1930s, but by the 1940s after World War II, Washington was a much bigger town. There's a lot more money flowing there. And there was a sense that Washington, I mean, the federal government, is supposed to get involved in all manner of things, including disasters. And because of technology and communications, there's a sense that presidents know about these disasters with more immediacy and feel a need to act in them. But it's still unusual for a president to actually go down to a disaster site. And in 1969, when Hurricane Camille happens, again in that dangerous Gulf region, you got to think maybe they should be aware of their uh, propensity for hurricanes over there, but they're, they're, Hurricane Camille takes place. And President Nixon is in charge at the time. And he does not go down, but he does send Herbert, um, sorry, not Herbert, Herbert, Spiro Agnew, who is his vice president. He sends Spiro Agnew down to report back to the president on what's going on. And Agnew goes down and he brings a very good report back to the president, but he says one thing that catches Nixon's ear. He says that the people in the Gulf regions could really benefit from having some form of measuring or gauging hurricanes to, to note their severity, to know whether they should evacuate, should they shelter in place, what should they do? How big is a problem the, 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 of the impending hurricane? And Nixon directs the bureaucracy to look into this issue, and that is what led to the current categorization of hurricanes that we have. The category one through five hurricanes comes from that Nixon directive to the bureaucracy. A couple of people in the National Weather Service came up with this concept of the one to five categorization. So in this case, you have the vice president going down to the region, not the president, but you have a new technological innovation in the form of the category through one through five severity index. Now there's also, as this is going on, a sense that disasters can be perilous for presidents. I, in my piece today, I talk about uh, Gerald Ford and the 1976 swine flu. Ford heard about the swine flu, was worried about the severity of the swine flu, and he asked the American people to go out there and get a shot. He said, and there's a quote, that every man, woman, and child should go out and get this swine flu shot. And Ford photographed himself getting the shot as to, so as to encourage the American people. Now, there are a couple of problems with what happened, with what Ford was recommending. Number one, the vast majority of the American people did not go along. Only about 30 to 40 million people went along and got the shot. But it may have been a good thing that not everybody went along because there is a syndrome called Julian Barr syndrome, which uh, killed about 25 to 30 people who took the shot. And the swine flu wasn't as severe as government had, had worried about. So the, if everybody had gotten the shot, more people probably would have died, and the flu wasn't that severe that it really required it. But there's a question of why you didn't have that many people take up the shot. I mean, still in the millions, but it wasn't the vast majority of Americans. It certainly was far from every man, woman, and child. And part of it is because the government stopped the program. But part of it, I posit, 
is that there was a loss of presidential credibility following Watergate, that after Nixon's resignation, there are people who are a little more skeptical of what government said. And that's a worry from a presidential perspective. If you don't have presidential credibility, you're not going to be able to ask the American people to do different difficult things in times of crisis or disaster. Now, in 1992, we have an interesting case of George H.W. Bush, who's president after the Gulf War, he's kind of riding high in the polls, and his, uh, his approval ratings are at 88%, and everybody thinks he's cruising towards re-election. But in that year, 1992, there's a terrible hurricane in Florida called Hurricane Andrew. Hurricane Andrew is one of these first circumstances where people looked at the, Ameri the federal response to a hurricane and said, boy, this is wanting. And there's a woman who was from the Dade County Emergency Management Response Unit and she got on TV, and this is before you had the concept of clips going viral, because you didn't have an internet, but you did have clips that could be played all over the country on the nightly news, and this clip was played everywhere. And there was this woman saying, at long last, where is the cavalry? Asking where's the cavalry, where is the federal assistance? And President Bush's poor response to that particular disaster, to Her um, Andrew, was used as a signal that he was insufficiently interested in domestic problems and that he only cared about what was going on internationally. And there was a lot going on internationally and he actually did a great job in terms of managing the end of the Cold War and the Gulf War, and et cetera. But there was a sense that he wasn't concerned about the pain of Americans. And remember, Bill Clinton runs in that election against him. Nobody gives Clinton much of a chance, but Clinton has that famous line, I feel your pain. And there was a sense that Clinton empathized with people, understood the concerns of people in a way that George H.W. Bush didn't. And that particular hurricane of Andrew kind of encapsulated the sense of Bush's lack of concern. And so flash forward a little bit, and his son, George W. Bush, Texan, former Texas governor, becomes president. And in the first term of his presidency, which is obviously hit with the 9-11 attack, for which he mostly got good marks in response, but he also gets a reputation in that first term for being very, very good at dealing with weather disasters. The government is quick, it's efficient, you don't have uh, the sense of political hacks at FEMA, but you have people who have experience in disaster management, and he's so good and efficient at dealing with disasters of the weather variety in that first term that there are even some cynical reporters who say that, well, he learned the lessons from his father and Andrew, at Andrew, and as a result, that's why he's so responsive to hurricanes and, and weather disasters at home, because he doesn't want to have that problem that his father had. And in fact, Andy Card, who was a deputy chief of staff in the George H. W. Bush administration and was charged with the Andrew response, was the chief of staff in the George W. Bush response, administration and was uh, therefore supposed to deal with disasters. And, and they really kept a tight rein on what was going on with disasters, FEMA, was relatively efficient and they, and they had a good reputation and good marks. However, we all know the other side of the story, which is George, a, George W. Bush's reputation today is not one as someone who is good at dealing with weather-borne disasters, and we all remember the Katrina disaster. And in Katrina, there was a sense that the federal government wasn't doing what it should, that the federal government was kind of falling all over itself, not well organized, that there was not good coordination with the states and the localities. And in the book, I do put some of the blame on the states and localities, and I think there's definitely blame that should go there. But there was, there was also blame to go on the federal response. And part of it was from a communications standpoint. I talked earlier about FDR and how good he was at communicating with the American people during disaster. Well, George W. Bush, during Katrina, there's one point where he's being criticized for still being on vacation. So he leaves vacation, he starts flying back to Washington, and some people are saying maybe he should go to the affected area. He doesn't fly down and land in Louisiana, and there are good reasons for it. When a president goes to a disaster during the worst of the crisis, he taxes local resources. People have to help set up the motorcade and security. And those people, those very same first responders, are supposed to be dealing with the crisis at hand. So there's good reasons for President not to land in a disaster area. But still, President Bush wants to show something, some in level of interest, and so he flies over the affected area. And there's a picture taken of him looking down on the affected area. And that picture was the worst picture of the Bush administration, of the Bush presidency. And that picture, again, try kind of encapsulated the sense that Bush 
was being ineffectual, was not in charge, and was somewhat callous. I think it's unfair, but the fact remains that that picture did take place, and that picture really did harm his reputation. And in the book, I found a very similar picture of Lyndon Johnson. I know we're right near the LBJ school. We probably have some LBJ students here. But Lyndon Johnson, during the 1968 riots that took place after Martin Luther King's assassination, at one point, he flies over riot-torn areas of Washington, D.C. and looks down upon them. And there's a picture taken of him in Marine One that, again, I have in the book. And you look at that picture, and he looks eerily like George W. Bush after Katrina. So the lesson I will give to you is if you are a president, there may be reasons to go to a disaster area. There may be reasons not to go to a disaster area. But no matter what, don't do a flyover to a disaster area, because that doesn't work. And so where are we today? We have the likelihood that the next president will face some kind of disaster. We can't know what it is, but it's likely it's going to happen, whether it's a weatherborne disaster or maybe some kind of massive cyber attack that damages our electric grid or a bioterror attack or, a, or some kind of pandemic. Uh, massive terror attacks, unfortunately, are always looming and we have the potential of them. So it's clear that whoever is president next is going to have to deal with some kind of crisis, some kind of disaster. Will they be able to do it? You know, I as I write my journal piece today, have some concerns. On the Hillary Clinton side, presidential credibility, and this applies to Trump as well, but presidential credibility is so important. If you're going to have someone get up there and ask the American people to do something difficult, you need to have the American people believe what you're saying. And with Hillary's problems with the email and her illnesses and uh, not telling the truth about the pneumonia initially, there's just a sense that her first instinct is not to tell the truth. And in fact, there was a time when she was asked on, on, uh, by a reporter, do you always tell the truth? Have you always told the truth while you're in government? And she said, and this is a quote, I tried to. <laughs> tried to is not good enough when there's a major crisis and you need the American people to respond. But you also need someone who speaks judiciously and who doesn't go off half-cocked and doesn't run in before all the facts are known. And Donald Trump has a tendency to just mouth off without necessarily knowing what the facts are and fully what's going on. So I have concerns about both of them. Now, in order to be not too pessimistic, I try and put in some positive characteristics of each of them. I thought Trump was somewhat savvy when he went down to Louisiana during the recent flooding and handed out supplies to the victims. I thought that, had a, that gave a sense of uh, presence, but also of compassion for victims. And Hillary uh, has not only bounced back from many crises over her life, but also has a, um, uh, has a good sense of the federal government. And you need to understand all the levers of the federal government in dealing with response. In fact, I always say that if you go to a disaster area, and the federal people go to a disaster area, and they start handing cards out to other disaster experts or the other uh, disaster responders from the federal government, you've already failed. Because if they're handing out their business cards, that means they don't know each other, they don't know their lines of responsibility, they don't know their capabilities. And, and Ryan, we saw this in, in Katrina. People were falling all over themselves, they didn't know what to do, and they hadn't sufficiently drilled these things. And one thing I learned in government is the importance of drilling and doing these tabletop exercises so that people know what to do when there's a crisis. I remember uh, some of these, these um, drills where it would be these wacky scenarios where there is a dirty bomb that goes off at the same time that there's a massive flu outbreak. And I remember in one of these things, what we learned that we didn't anticipate, that we didn't think about in advance, and we did practice for some of these scenarios beforehand, was that there's a problem called the worried well of people who are not affected by the disease or by the radiological bomb, but they think they are, and they swamp the hospitals. The hospitals have enough capacity to deal with the sick people in this scenario, but they didn't have enough capacity to deal with the people who think they might be sick. And that overwhelmed the system. And so these kinds of things are the things you need to think about in advance. And in the 2009 swine flu, for example, I mentioned earlier that most of the senior officials had not yet been confirmed to the new administration. So for the most part, it was career officials dealing with that swine flu and responding to it. And for the most part, these career officials had drilled before and were familiar with communications protocols, and they did a pretty good job. In fact, there was a guy named Rich Besser, who was at CDC at the time, Centers for Disease Control, and he's now, he did such a good job, not only did he help alleviate American concerns during the 
epidemic, but he also, he parlayed that into a job as now he's chief medical correspondent for uh, ABC News because he showed himself to be so good on TV. But in that episode, there was also another person who didn't do so well. Here was a, someone in the executive branch, but new to the executive branch. And this is Vice President Joe Biden, who said, I wouldn't let myself or anyone in my family get in an enclosed space right now, which threatened to warn people off uh, tr uh, public transportation and airlines and, and could have had a devastating effect on our economy. Uh, Biden, even though he has a long history in government, did not have a long history in the executive branch. He'd only been there for a few months and had not yet sufficiently had the drills and the training to make sure he knew the right things to say in those times. So it's really important to prepare for disasters. You can't know what disaster is going to come, but you can know that you are going to face disasters and you need, if you're the president, to think about these things and have a team that is also ready to deal with them. And that's the lesson of the book and I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. We have a question over here. Ladies first in, in my book. I don't know. That is a really good question, a question I've not received before. And I'll tell you quite honestly, the way I did it was I decided I was going to have this appendix. I went through the book and I said, who did the worst? And I made my somewhat subjective evaluation. I mean, when 675,000 people die, I didn't have any other disasters of that magnitude. And that's why I put Woodrow Wilson at the worst. But uh, in terms of the third versus the fourth worst, we can have arguments about it. But that's why I laid it out in an appendix so people can have discussions about it. But it's, it's a really good question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So in terms of the Harrison situation, uh, there were specific requests that the people of Johnstown had made about the use of the, um, the medical corps that the Army had at the time. And so there were some standing assets. But you're right. As government grows, it has more and more capacity and can do, and do more things. But I don't necessarily think that the growth of government should necessarily mean there are more disasters. And we have found more and more disaster declarations over time. In fact, since we started having disaster declarations over time, I found that there's been a steady increase in the number of declarations each year, which suggests that there's a political component to it. And in fact, in Bill Clinton's first time, I found that there were about 50 disaster declarations in year one of his administration. And by year four of his administration, there were about 150. And similarly, I noticed that there is a spike in disaster declarations in presidential election years. So it does make me worry about the political components to it. But I'm glad you mentioned the Harrison thing because I forgot to mention one interesting fact about Harrison. While he did not send federal aid to the affected area in Johnstown, he did go and send a $300 personal donation to the people of Johnstown, which today I figured out via an inflation calculator is probably about $7,500. So it's not like he was callous or uncaring. He did what he could and had the capacity to do at the time. So I think the capacity issue is a really important one. It is requested by the, um, by the states, and then the president approves it. And um, what it does is it releases what's called Stafford Act funding in order to respond to a disaster. But it, again, it has a political component. So in 1977, there was a terrible blackout in New York City. And I actually was living in New York City at the time, and remember, it was kind of a scary time. In 1965, there had also been a blackout in New York City which was not nearly as scary. In fact, people took out picnic baskets and they went into Central Park and they had a nice time. And in fact, nine months later, people tittered that the, uh, the delivery rooms were filled with babies being born nine months after that, that particular blackout. There was no tittering in the 77 blackout. The blackout was a real problem. There was looting. There was uh, a lot of um, uh, crime was rampant and there was a sense that the police were overmatched. And New York City did request disaster aid and a disaster declaration from Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter said no. Interestingly, this raised the specter of something that Gerald Ford had done, Carter's predecessor, not long before, when New York City was facing bankruptcy and asked for a federal bailout, and Ford refused to provide said bailout. And one of the most fe famous headlines in history was in the New York Daily News said, Ford to NY, drop dead. 
And that certainly did not help Ford's efforts to win New York State in 1976, back at a time when Republicans could actually win New York State. Um, it was a, a state that was up for grabs back then, no longer is. But Carter's refusal to give that disaster declaration definitely hurt him in, uh, politically in terms of his attempt to uh, win New York State. But also, I, I think it was a short-sighted move because it was, it was a sufficiently large disaster and caused enough problems. So, um, so th there is sometimes a political component to the disaster declaration. Although I would say that today, having learned the lessons of Carter, I think when presidents are presented with a compelling request from states, they just tend to offer up the disaster declaration. Good question. I'm glad you asked about the, the Zika situation. Obviously, Zika is a worrisome virus. It is mosquito-borne, and it has relatively few effects on adults who get the bite. But if you are pregnant and you have a, a child in gestation, those, child, those children have a large chance, a high chance of being born with a significant birth defect. And interestingly and worrisomely, this disease appears to be sexually transmissible, transmissible, which is an unusual thing for these kinds of diseases. So men who get bitten by the mosquito, get the disease, are potentially contagious through sexual transmission for up to six months, which is really something we haven't had to deal with with this kind of birth defect granting uh, or, or giving disease. So the executive branch said, we want $1.9 billion to deal with Zika, and we're going to decide how to spend it. And Congress said, well, actually, we have some role in this, and we want to know how you're going to be spending the money, and we want to make sure that the money's not going to go to other areas. We don't, money's fungible. We don't want this money to be an open-ended check to the uh, Obama administration to do what they want with it. And the Congress came back with a $600 million offer. Well, between the $1.9 million and the $600 million, million, there was just no common ground, and, and that just wasn't going to be sorted out. But the Senate, doing what the Senate is supposed to do, because the Senate is not majority run, but you have the filibuster and you need to get uh, above that 60 vote threshold. So things happen in a more bipartisan way in the Senate, although perhaps not lately as much, but in general, that's the idea. The Senate, they worked out what should be the reasonable compromise, which is about $1.1 billion uh, with some idea of where the money's going. And for a variety of reasons, they have been fighting and fighting over this money for weeks, months now, and still haven't sorted out when it's so obvious what the solution is, which is this $1.1 billion compromise. So I'm someone, I worked in a Republican administration, I make no bones about my uh, GOP status, but I'm someone who argues for what I call, and I wrote an article in Political a couple years about it, entering the neutral zone when it comes to disasters. Let's put partisan concerns aside when we have these kinds of disasters and just try and come up with the right solution. In this case, it's, it's clear what the, the solution is. I think Congress is going to get there before they head out of town, but it, it, it is a disturbing situation because what I've been finding in recent years, and the reason I initially wrote that piece about the neutral zone, it even predated this whole Zika fight, but it was in the response to the 2009 swine flu situation. And you had people on the right, like Glenn Beck, saying, I wouldn't take a flu vaccine that's recommended by Obama's Department of Homeland Security, which is, I think, insane. And then you had people on the left, like Bill Maher, saying only idiots will take the flu vaccine because of his animus towards pharmaceutical companies. And he said it's uh, like putting a live virus in your arm, which it is not. So it worried me, this sense that if Hillary Clinton's elected and there's some kind of disease and she says, recommends taking this vaccine or her Department of Homeland Security or her head of HHS says take this vaccine and people say, well, I voted for Trump, I'm not gonna do it. Or vice versa, if Trump wins, and Lord knows there's a lot of people who don't like Trump, and he says, people, we should take this vaccine. It's going to be great or whatever else he says about it. Uh, but uh, uh, he says, we need to take this vaccine or his department or his uh, HHS head, Ben Carson, says take the, uh, the, the vaccine. And people don't do it because, oh, I didn't vote for that guy in the primaries or I didn't vote for that guy in the election. It's insane. It's, it, and it really leads us down to a very problematic path. And so whoever is elected president in this crazy election, I hope the American people can kind of set aside the animosity from the campaign and say, okay, this person's the president, they're duly elected, and I may not like them, I may not agree with everything they do, but to the extent that there are emergencies and disasters and we need to respond, if they say evacuate, or if they say shelter in place, or if they say get a vaccine, you should listen to them. 
It's a good question. So Ron Klain, whom I, I don't know personally, but I, I certainly know his reputation, uh, was chosen, and he's a political person and not a health expert in, in any way. Um, and I, was, I must confess, I was skeptical of the appointment and wrote so in, in the Wall Street Journal at the time. But uh, there's also reason and value in putting a person who knows the levers of government and can bring people together. And I've heard him interviewed recently or subsequently, um, and he said, look, we have lots of public health experts in government. The, the problem wasn't lack of public health expertise. The problem was government's inability to work together and to get the answers they needed. And in fact, he said that he would put together these meetings and usually, and Ryan can verify this when you're in the White House, if you have a deputies level meeting, you only have deputies at the meeting and God forbid someone below would come. And then if you have principals meeting, you have principals, which are assistants to the president or secretaries. And then if you have policy time with the president, again, you don't have junior people, you only have certain levels senior. He said he threw all that out and he said he's gonna bring people from all levels who had knowledge and expertise and just put them around the table and try and get answers. So I, there is some value to doing that. And the Ebola thing did tamp down after Ron's appointment. Uh, I'm not gonna say it was just because Ron's such a great guy and so talented, I mean, it may have been a timing issue, right? I mean, you, you, you sort of mentioned the, I guess, falseness of the crisis or the sense that it was overblown. Uh, and maybe the worst had already passed. And, and the truth is, with Ebola, it is, it's less worrisome than Zika in that good infection controls can control a virus like Ebola. What does that mean? Certain procedures about sterility and limiting the spread of the fluids from a body and cleaning up afterwards, things that we have in modern American hospitals, these are the kind of things that can control the spread of Ebola and, and put it under control. Um, put it under submission. And we, I think, and I know there's a hospital in Dallas that um, had some of the mistakes, but pretty quickly we realized there were, there were some of these mistakes and we started taking it more seriously. And in a, again, in a modern, a modern health system, a disease like Ebola should not spread. Now Zika is more worrisome because you might have the disease, but you're ambulatory the whole time and you are active and you can go out and do things, you might feel a little bit under the weather, but again, sexually transmissible for six months. So it's a different type of scenario. It's harder to do uh, infection controls and also what's known as track and trace, which is to track people's movements. And that's what also what you have to do in a situation like Ebola. So it does not surprise me that after some hiccups, the government uh, got its act together, not necessarily because of Ron Klain, but uh, I, I think he benefited from buying the stock while low and then <laughs> he, saw, he saw the stock grow. I'm so glad you asked that question. It is a great question because it's one of the arguments in my book and one of the messages of the book is that we have these expectation that the president jumps in with every disaster and maybe we shouldn't have that expectation for every disaster. And maybe there are certain types of disasters that should be presidential level and presidents should get involved with. And there are others that perhaps should be devolved either to lower parts of the federal government or to the states. Uh, an example of this I think is weather-borne disasters. I think, I think there's not that much a president can or should do in case of weather. Now, it's fraught with peril, as I said, because you can have a communications misstep or appear not to be on the ball, but you really don't need the president to deal with a weatherborne disaster. But something like a bioterror attack, you really need the resources of the federal government to prepare for that kind of thing. We have a strategic national stockpile, which has built uh, countermeasures so that we can deal with uh, all sorts of problems, whether they're either a, a bioterror type of pathogen or a naturally occurring pathogen. But that's not the kind of thing you can really expect the state of Idaho to do to put up funding and encourage the development of countermeasures. That really, that's really a federal responsibility. So I argue in the book that there should be things that the federal government does and the president particularly should have his eye on, but that there are other things that maybe shouldn't be in presidential responsibility and we should take the expectations away from the president. I think that's a, that's a great point and it's really one of the, the key messages in the book. All right. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you very much for, for being here and for this presentation. I think that raises a lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions about how those of you who aspire to a, a career in public service, uh, if you're in a position of, of being in the uh, executive branch at the state or federal level, 
what the transmission of information today compared to the past means for your job, makes it much more difficult. I remember ten, just 10 years ago when, when we, we were in the White House sitting in my office with a split screen TV, we had four stations that came across the, the TV at once, three cable networks, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, and then C-SPAN. And I remember sitting at my desk, looking up and seeing the three panes with exactly the same helicopter shot of the old executive office building of the White House saying, White House being evacuated because of bomb scare. And I'm sitting at my desk. <laughs> and we had these little walkie talkies that were supposed to transmit emergency messages. It and, never worked. And they, yeah, I ran out into the hall thinking it's, the bomb's going to go off and I'm the last guy in here. <laughs> Turned out they, it was isolated because some Yahoo threw a backpack over the south and they were just evacuating those offices. But today it would have been a lot different with Twitter. Uh, with other forms of social media, I would have found out about that and found out what was going on instead of just looking at my split screen. So things, things change, change very rapidly. I encourage you to pick up the book. Uh, fo uh, take take our, the article with you. Take the postcards with you. Like us on Facebook. Um, be sure to um, uh, buy the book if you haven't already. Amazon has a great price for the book. Amazon has a great price for the book. Yeah, and, uh, and we'll look forward to an opportunity we can bring you back to UT. Again, thanks for being here.